And thank you for joining us. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis, your host. Joining us here on the program today is Greg Leroy. He is the author of The Great American Jobs Scam. And I've got to admit, when I first heard the title of this book, I thought, what American Jobs Scam? As far as I know, isn't the new administration bringing in new jobs? Isn't the economy beginning to turn around and shift to where people are working and money is moving again? So I thought it'd be interesting that we should explore this just to find out what exactly truly is going on out there and maybe what the media isn't telling us or maybe what they just don't know. And I'd like to welcome to the program our guest today, Greg Leroy. And Greg, thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. Great to be with you, Daniel. You bet. Now, great American job scam. Okay, so what's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is really about how states and cities have been spending our money, our taxpayer dollars for for decades, really, in the name of economic development, uh, with good intentions, but often with one hand tied behind their back, really hamstrung by a system that that um, enables companies to run circles around public officials and game the system in a way that that rigs the game. I I would say uh, we have this thing called the economic war among the states, where the federal government has allowed the states to race to the bottom to see who is willing to pay the most for these big, high-profile. Um, trophy deals, so to speak, these big multi-state competitions like the Boeing Superliner deal a few years ago that, that was won by the state of Washington or these auto sub, you know, transplant deals that you hear about sometimes where especially southern states uh, compete very aggressively you know, with you know, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, per plant in some cases. Um, and then at the, at the regional level and the, at the state level, there's also a problem of companies just moving around or threatening to move around even just within the same metropolitan area uh, and getting big bucks to, to be paid to stay or to be paid to move into a place they probably would have gone anyway. I mean, that's, that's the basic problem. It's a scam because uh, we're giving companies, you know, so-called corporate welfare, lots of different kinds of uh, incentives or subsidies, choose your word, to do what they would have done anyway in, in almost every case. You know, I'm curious because <clears throat> many people are very familiar with what happened with uh, the big insurance bailout last year, and then you started seeing more of that going to banking institutions. I think, okay, so Congress just decides they're going to go ahead and just take our money out of our pockets, go and bail these people out who basically, as far as most people were concerned, were stewarding their own companies in a very poor way. But yet this has been going on for quite a while, and it's been happening so under the radar. So what is it that people are missing? What information is missing here? Is it just the way it's being presented to us, sort of a, a bait and switch, if you will? Well, and that's a great question. And we always say that sunshine you know, is the best antiseptic here, that, that if people really could see this system, they wouldn't stand for it. And, mm -hmm. and that's certainly one of the big criticisms everybody's making now of the, the so-called TARP program, the bank bailout program, is that, uh, it's not transparent. It's very opaque, and uh, and and that's why there's so many problems with it. So, um, first and foremost, when we say how do you clean the system up, we say disclosure, and by that we mean online, you know, availability of company-specific reports. We should be able to see how many dollars each company got, what they said they were going to do with the money, how many jobs were they going to create, how good were the wage <coughs> benefits going to be, and then. We should be able to see, you know, did they deliver? Did they create as many jobs? Did they pay as good a wage? You know, did we get our bang for the buck? Um, about half the states now have some information like that online, and that's been a big increase in recent years from, from almost nothing uh, five years ago to half the states putting something on, online. Now, we still have a lot of issues with the quality of that data, and obviously the other 25 states have to catch up. Um, and even at the federal level now with the Recovery Act, with President Obama's Recovery Act, we're still arguing with the Office of Management and Budget about exactly how good that data is going to be, too, because we're, we haven't seen the first round of data yet. Now, would you say that the Obama administration is actually turning around? It sounds like a very ugly scapegoat in some ways uh, to make things better, but even though it's not going to happen overnight because, as you said, this has been going on for quite a while, but do you see any real effort being made to move in that direction to make sure that this doesn't continue to happen? I do. I mean, um, we're a nonprofit, nonpartisan group, and if you were to put the D's and the R's after the villains in my book, you'd see about equal numbers of both parties. <laughs> this, is, this is not a, a partisan issue. 
Um, but I will give President Obama credit. He is a bona fide transparency buff. Um, when he was a state senator in Illinois, he voted for a bill. He, he was not the lead sponsor, but he, he supported a bill which created the best transparency system and best uh, website of any state in the country. It, and it was actually associated with a study that we issued. It was a, a law prompted by a study we issued. So I'm very familiar with that chain of events. And then as a U.S. senator in 2006, in a very bipartisan gesture, a very consistent with his history on, this, on these issues, he co-sponsored a bill with a very conservative Republican, uh, Senator Tom Coburn from Oklahoma, mm -hmm. a bill that created a website called usaspending.gov. And this law sort of dragged Uncle Sam into the late 20th century in terms of uh, computerized uh, transparency. It was the first time that, that all federal contracts and all federal grants were visible in one place on the web. And, and now with the recovery.gov website for the Recovery Act coming online, that's really going to be kind of the web 2.0, you know, leapfrogging of, of usaspending.gov. And, and that's why we're so concerned about the quality of the Recovery Act data, because it seems likely that whatever precedent they set for this new uh, recovery.gov website is going to then apply, is going to really uh, improve the quality of disclosure coming from all, all the executive branch agencies. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, a lot of people, for instance, to give a good example, I suppose, is we take a look at for instance, the war in Iraq, was this one of those situations where companies were profiting in a manner uh, that is almost similar to what we're talking about here? Or is that something different? Um, well, certainly when you have uh, sole source contracting and no-bid contracts um, for you know, the Blackwaters and the Halliburtons of the world, that was a very problematic situation. There's, that, there's two kinds of spending we're talking about here. There's kind of contracting or procurement where the government's actually buying something. It's buying um, protection or it's buying a, a, the construction of a bridge or it's um, you know, something like that. And there's economic development uh, incentives. And, and obviously Uncle Sam and, and state governments do gobs of both. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and historically, um, the economic development spending, which is our primary focus, has been even less transparent than procurement. For instance, mo almost uh, all 50 states do reporting on their procurement contracts, uh, and they do a better job of reporting on that than they do on their economic development incentives you know, by a long shot, frankly. So the, the biggest um, catching up we have to do, frankly, is on the, the, that part of the uh, spending in which we're giving money to private companies in the name of a public purpose, in the name of economic development, but we're not actually purchasing something, you know, like a tank or a mm -hmm. or a bridge for it. Okay. Now let's kind of break it down so people get a better understanding as they listen to this program how this whole system works, what goes on uh, in the process. Sure. So <clears throat> when a company is looking to expand or relocate a facility, m most companies, especially bigger companies, hire what are called a site location consultant. These are people who actually specialize in identifying the most profitable place for a company to expand or relocate. And they say to the site location consultant, you know, the nature of our business is we need a lot of uh, water or we need a lot of electricity or we need a lot of software code writers and we want to be close to these kinds of customers and we want to be close to these kinds of um, uh, materials that we're in, and skills that we use in our business. Go find us the best uh, short list of locations that has those those things in it. And the site location goes off and uh, develops a list of maybe you know, six, eight, ten places that uh, have what it takes. And they go back to the company, and the company says, well, I, we don't like those places. Those are too far. Those places are, we, our competitors are already there. Let's narrow the list down to three, four, five places now. And only at that stage, then, does the consultant go on site and knock on the doors of those cities or those counties and say, you know, I've got a company here I'm not going to tell you yet who they are, but, but they're looking at locating a 300-person a facility um, that needs X, Y, Z um, physical inputs, and uh, w what have you got for us? What can, we, what can you do in terms of uh, you know, property tax abatements and income tax uh, rebates and sales tax exemptions and so on and so forth? Um, and now the, the cities are literally what's called a prisoner's dilemma. They don't know who the company is for a while. They don't know who the other 
competing locations are. They they have to really kind of take the consultant's word for it as to who they're competing with or what uh, incentives are being offered by those other locations. And uh, the company may have already made its mind up by now. It may have already decided it's going to go to City A, but because of the the ability to game the system, they will play hard to get and continue to pit City A against cities B, C, D, and E mm-hmm. to get them to up the ante, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And then at some point they'll make their decision and make an announcement. And obviously, when they when the press release is issued and the mayor you know congratulates himself for landing the the company with the 300 jobs, the whole business is framed as if the the tax breaks are what made the decision. But the point we always say is, well, not really. The reason that the company ever even talked to that city was because the city already has the business basics. It has what the company needs to be profitable. This was The, the tax breaks are, are icing on a cake, but the cake was already baked. Oh, I see. That's really what we're saying here. <clears throat> um, but because the system is, is gameable, uh, because of this, the history of the way it's grown up, um, companies can really control the bargaining because they've got more information than the cities do. And mm-hmm. cities are, even if the cities find out who they're competing with, they're not allowed to talk to each other during the bidding process. It, it just, it, to me, just seems so interesting. It's almost as though the, the, the politicians don't really have a clue. They, they often don't. They really have a... They too often take a very narrow view of cause and effect. Um, they fall Whatever it takes the for them to stay in office, it sounds like. <laughs> right, right. And obviously, there's a, you know, especially with the soft economy right now, there's a, a huge amount of political benefits to, to getting to cut a ribbon and issue a press release and, right. and claim credit. But, um, and often the costs of these deals play out over many years. They often get paid for by somebody else who comes along in the next term and has to you know, deal with the, the lack of revenue. Mm-hmm. You know, it's really interesting to think about this because you're talking about what seems to be fairly large companies. So I kind of wonder when it comes to, you know, basically all this, you know, tax breaks and so forth, how does this affect small businesses and local entrepreneurs? Because I, I know a few myself, and they're like, every time there seems to be a problem, for instance, within the county, the first thing they do is they go after the business and they raise taxes, but then you have these big companies, as you're talking about, assessing an area to move into, and the icing on the cake, they already know they're going to be profitable moving into an area, but then on top of that they get tax breaks too. And you wonder, what really does happen to the small business or the entrepreneur? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And frankly, the small business people are getting the the short end of the stick in this system. (laughs) They're actually paying those guys, it sounds like. (laughs) They are, they are. Um, if If you ask yourself, who has the army of consultants who can, you know, game the system the most aggressively, it's the big boys. It's the companies that have the ability to move across state lines or to threaten anyway to move across state lines. Um, and I'll be honest with you, I've been publicly critical for years of some of the bigger um, small business uh, associations out there like the National Federation of Independent Business or NFIB. Uh, in almost no state can I find any record of an NFIB chapter speaking out on this issue. An example, for instance, NFIB has a lot of retail members, and we have documented the fact that Walmart has received more than $1.2 billion uh, in economic development incentives over the years for about 300 of its facilities. And obviously, they're taking business away from small retailers when they open up in many, many cities. Mm-hmm. And yet, NFIB doesn't have an opinion on this. Uh, that strikes me as, as uh, kind of being missing in action on this. Mm-hmm. Um, there are a couple of alternative small business associations now that are slowly uh, looking at this issue, but, but they haven't really stepped up to the plate. Um, I think what goes on here is that small bus- you're right. Small business people get their, their taxes raised. There's really a burden shift that goes on. When a big company comes to town and, and says, we don't want to pay property taxes for 10 or 20 years, and we're not going to pay sales tax on our new building, and we're not going to – and we're going to uh, – take income taxes and so on out of the system, uh, only two things can happen when that, when that new company arrives because there's going to be growth, right? There's going to be, you're going to have to hire more teachers and widen more roads and pick up more trash. Either everybody else's taxes are going to go up a little bit to help absorb the costs of that growth or the quality of those public services is going to go down uh, or a little bit of both. 
Mm-hmm. But but it, it's, if the newly arriving company isn't paying its fair share of the costs of that growth, uh, something's got to give. And and the little guy, the little homeowner, the small business person, the people who are not able to game the system, frankly, are the ones that, that uh, get the burden shifted onto them. You know, it's just amazing to think about. You think about a Walmart moves into an area, they're already going to be profitable just due to the sheer ability to be able to get people to bring in the products that they sell at such low prices. So at the same time, then you got the small retailers, you were saying, has the same products, but they have to raise the prices because they have to pay the taxes for these tax breaks on these bigger companies. And you kind of wonder, it's interesting because I'm sure you probably will agree that most jobs are created by the small business owner you know, versus the large one. And you think, you know, how do we shift this, and is that actually go- going to happen? No, I totally agree. You know, there's conflicting statistical arguments about exactly what share of job growth is attributable to small companies, and and there's definitional fights about exactly what a small company is. But I think everybody agrees, no matter how you slice and dice the data, that the majority of new job creation is in smaller employers. And I would say, even more important, the jobs created by by locally owned and small companies are safer. They're more stable. They're less Mm -hmm. subject to globalization, less subject to being uh, yanked across state lines than companies, uh, the jobs in in big multinational or multi-state companies. And therefore, we should be favoring those kinds of companies in our economic development policies. We should be um, acknowledging the fact that they have uh, stronger local ripple effects. They, They do their banking locally. They they participate in local charities more. Uh, Some studies indicate that they even pay better and uh, more jobs are full-time and have health care benefits. You know, so if that's true, if if they really do give us a better economic bang for our buck, why aren't we favoring those kinds of companies in the way we write our rules for our economic development tax breaks? Very interesting question, too, that's for sure. Now, when we talk uh, as on this program, as we uh, talk about the baby boomer generation or the middle age where people are still active. <laughs> you're talking to me. You're talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really uh, it's quite interesting to take a look at this and how it affects them and what contributions they may or may not make in this process and what the outcomes will be for this group of people. Can you tell us about that? Sure, I mean, I think there's two two things playing out for boomers right now. W- one is, and I say this to a lot of audiences that are mostly composed of boomers, is that um, we should be very mindful right now of the quality of jobs getting created for young people. We should be very mindful that the skills of the people that are going to take our jobs as we retire are really great, are really that these people have high productivity and the ability to command good wages because I want my Social Security trust fund to be as safe as possible. And I know the only way that's going to happen is if the people who succeed me are earning good good paychecks and able to sustain uh, good payments into the trust fund. Uh, and, you know, there, this is kind of a slow motion train wreck playing out. We know from many studies that the Department of Labor and private consulting groups have done that there are certain occupations that are unusually gray. An example right now, for instance, is uh, transit uh, drivers and transit mechanics and bus drivers and bus mechanics. We know that occupationally that's a very gray group, and we also know that transit ridership is setting new records right now as people are more people are choosing to get out of their cars and every time gas prices go up. And yet we don't have a specific plan right now to get more people trained to be transit operators and mechanics, even though we know we're going to need more of them and we know they're older than average. So um, we need to be, and these are good jobs and they're steady jobs, and we, and we mm-hmm. should pay attention to those. So I think that's one issue for boomers is we want, to, we want to think hard about our successor skills. The other issue, obviously, is that some boomers are going to be working longer than, than the generation before because we're healthier, because we want to, and in some cases because we have to because of what's been happening to our retirement savings in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. And uh, and frankly, some of us need to get up to speed on new skills. We need new computer skills or information technology skills, uh, networking skills, you know, uh, a lot of new jobs getting created now that didn't even exist when we entered the the job market. Uh, And, you know, we know from many studies that 
if you were to look at how, where we get the best bang for our buck in training dollars, we get the best bang for the buck retraining incumbent workers while they're still on a job. Enabling people to, to uh, expand their skills on an existing job is by far the most cost-effective way we can spend training dollars. And yet again, we don't, this is not a national priority. Mm -hmm. our, our training system is great for dislocated workers. It's great for young workers. It's great for helping people who need uh, extra help because they didn't uh, finish high school or whatever. Um, but we don't have as big a focus as we ought to on reskilling our boomer age incumbent workers, even though mm -hmm. that would give us a great bang for the buck. I know when you think, especially when you talk about transit transportation, I'd feel a lot safer having as you said earlier, the gray in the area than I would some 20-year-old probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just found that interesting that you said more gray than others, and I thought, is he re really referring to gray literally? <laughs> 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 now, uh, I know that you talk about uh, suburban sprawl, and as my understanding is that you're a fan of smart growth. Let's talk about what that is. Sure. So, you know, suburban sprawl means the, the thinning out of economic activity in a region and, the, the, and everything associated with that, the fact that um, everything depends on getting around by car, that mm -hmm. people don't walk on the streets very much, that it's not a great place to bicycle or jog or things like that. Um, it means that people drive more miles per year because things are further apart and, and therefore they use more gasoline and, and all the air pollution results from that. And, and it also means more traffic congestion because more people drive longer distances to get to work and to shop and so forth because of everything being so spread out and so auto-dependent. Obviously, there in Portland, for instance, and in, in some other metro areas of the country, you've had policies in place for some many years that have tried to um, slow that process down and reverse it. So you've had, for instance, in Portland, what are called urban growth boundaries, uh, where literally a belt, so to speak, around the metro area that stops development and preserves farmland at the edge of the metro area and, and really controls the rate of growth of the metro area in a way that encourages reinvestment. And downtown mm -hmm. Portland is a big, it's an international showcase success story of how policies like that can encourage downtown revitalization and the, the revitalization of places like the Pearl District and other uh, older neighborhoods in the city uh, so that people are encouraged to take transit, encouraged to ride their bicycles, uh, encouraged to live closer to work, uh, encouraged to live in areas that have a, a richness of mixed use, right, where you, you live right. close to where there's shopping and where there's leisure as well as residential. Those are all characteristics of smart growth. And um, we say that this is also about jobs. You know, if you look at, at um, areas like Detroit, which would be, or, or Atlanta, places that would be sort of on the opposite extreme from Portland in terms of uh, smart growth being on one end and sprawl being on the other end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. These are cities that have uh, very little choice for people about how to get around. And they also have uh, very troubling concentrations of poverty at their core. Mm -hmm. concentrated poverty among people of color, frankly, uh, of people at the, at the geographic core of those areas, uh, and people who cannot afford to own cars and cannot get to those new jobs out in suburbia because the only way you can get to those new jobs is by car. Right. But, but a lot of them cannot afford to own a car, so they're really trapped, and that's another symptom of sprawl. Um, so we say let's, let's – uh, make good use of our transit systems, let's use our economic development incentives to strongly encourage companies to locate jobs along transit routes so that everybody has a green choice about how to get to work, even if they can't afford a car. But people who can't afford a car can get to the jobs, have the right to compete to get themselves out of poverty. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's really kind of a double bottom line benefit here. There's a, an ecological benefit as well as an economic justice benefit. I think one thing is interesting. You bring up Portland, Oregon, is uh, with their policies. <clears throat> Excuse me. Is there is a tremendous amount of bicycling that goes on in this city, you know, and it's almost a whole different economy all by itself. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, you know, that wouldn't be a bad issue to continue to push forward in other states to where people become more and more like that. And the other thing that's interesting too 
is, for instance, uh, restaurants in Portland, as I understand, they do a lot of what I would call community buying. So instead of going to the big food services companies to get all their supplies, they really will shop locally at farms that are around the area and bring in you know, the fresh food, and that's what they feature on their menus as well. And you think of, just as you were saying, when you start getting a community to start supporting itself and being sustainable, you can almost find, a, 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 I guess, maybe a, a retailer like Walmart really ceasing to have any value to a community altogether. Yeah, you know, you've really got a number of uh, champions on this issue there locally. You've got the biggest regional body of government in the in the Met system there. You've got a history of urban growth boundaries that was, you know, very bipartisan uh, consensus, uh, you know, back dating to the mid and late 70s. You've got Congressman Blumenauer there, who's really kind of a champion for smart growth issues uh, on Capitol Hill. Um, you've got, and there's a debate right now actually playing out, uh, speaking to the, the biking and transportation issue, um, the so-called highway bill, which is really called the Surface Transportation Act. It comes up for reauthorization every six years. This is the way we decide to spend gasoline tax money at the federal level. And uh, a lot of smart growth advocates now are saying as we reauthorize that bill, Let's give our local and regional governments more freedom and, and flexibility about how to spend that money uh, in ways that's not just more asphalt for cars. Let's mm-hmm. at least give our regional governments a little bit more latitude to say we're going we're to have another bike lane, we're going to improve our transit service, we're going to upgrade our fleet or add some new routes uh, to transit, uh, as well as upgrade our roads and maintain our bridges and do all the things that we do for highways. Um, and certainly... Uh, some of your uh, representatives in that area are, are among the most experienced uh, lawmakers on that issue in the country. Mm-hmm. So you really see smart growth as being something that really is moving fairly solidly in the right direction then? I really do. I think it's the, it's the land use expression of the, of the consensus uh, for environmental protection in this country. Um, you know, there was a big study that came out a couple of years ago that made the point that you know, even with better fuel efficiency standards, even with alternative fuels, even with hybrid cars, um, if we don't change our built environment and give more people a choice about how to get around and not require everybody to do everything by, by turning a key in a car, we're never going to really reduce CO2 emissions from uh, tailpipes. Uh, we've we've got to give people a choice about how to get around. And you don't do that unless you... you um, Give people some density. Give people some mixed use. Give people the the transit choice when they when they want to take it. I know it was interesting when I was growing up. My parents decided to live in the country, but yet they worked in the city. And I thought to myself, "But what if the car doesn't work?" And you're not <laughs> farmers, <laughs> so I always chose to, to to be very close to work for the most part. You know, wherever I worked, you know, a, a reasonable way that I knew that I could get there and back, and it wasn't solely dependent on the car, just out of convenience alone, but it sounds like I was making a choice that is really based on, as you were talking about, smart uh, growth there. Very interesting stuff. Uh, You know, uh, I'm sure as we get the opportunity to uh, receive the book that this is really going to have a lot of detailed reading, what are one of the best expressions you'd like to share with our audience of why a book like this is necessary to help people open their eyes? Well, we just say... um, this book talks about a lot of things that, that don't get talked about very much. It knits together a story that has been told you know, in little itty-bitty fragments here and there by some newspapers and, and some other authors, but really uh, explains the whole system mm-hmm. of, of the way uh, state and local governments have been hoodwinked all these years and also lays out a whole chapter of solutions. I mean, we're very clear that we're not just aching and moaning here about how terrible things are. There are proven solutions. Right. We can, if we have more transparency, if we attach wage and health care rules, if we uh, use what are called clawbacks or, or money-back guarantee language, um, if we add smart growth strings to our incentives, uh, we can spend this money in ways that gets us better bang for the buck for taxpayers, uh, cleans up the environment, reduces poverty, uh, helps boomers, uh, cope with the reality of today's labor market. Uh, but we have to be intentional about it. We can't just let companies uh, control the system and, and tell our politicians what to do. No doubt. And I think actually with the election of Barack Obama is that society in America as a whole 
feels more confident that when they do take an action, that it's actually going to have the kind of reaction they feel encouraged for in the first place. And now it's time for people <clears throat> to not be so concerned about a big government, but now to start taking care of the government that's more at the local level and that they really truly do have a voice. And obviously with a book like yours, uh, The Great American Job Scams, and that if people just become better educated, then they know what proper action to take within their own ability and skill. I think that's right. And I think, you know, it's significant that we have a president who comes from a big city and, and spent a lot of time in his life in urban areas and appreciates the value of cities to the national economy. Um, and again, like I say, a guy who's a bona fide um, policy wonk, especially when it comes to transparency mm -hmm. and good government. Uh, I think those are uh, good tools no matter where you're coming from politically. Well, I completely agree. Now, Greg, could you go ahead and give out a website people can find out more about the book itself, maybe how to order it, and, and, and some information there? Absolutely. Um, the book is uh, at, on, you can get samples of it online at Great American Jobs, plural, there's an S there, scam.com. That's a website set up by the publisher, and there's ordering information on the website. And then if you want to see what I do by day, uh, and the work that certainly informed the book, uh, it's good jobs first, all one word, and first is spelled out, dot org. And we even just set up a new website about the Recovery Act. Mm -hmm. That's accountablerecovery.org. Well, I think, you know, having you on the program today is very encouraging because you realize it isn't a matter of trying to find more money to put into the economy to stimulate spending, spending, excuse me, but it's more about switching just the way we're doing things, and you'll find that the economy is a lot stronger underneath just by making smart decisions. Uh, no, we're absolutely convinced of that. We can spend less money on tax breaks for economic development, and we can get more. We can get more jobs, better wages, uh, a cleaner built environment. We're absolutely convinced of that. Well, Greg Leroy, it's been a real pleasure to have you here on the Beyond 50 radio program today, and I thank you for joining us and uh, helping open our listeners' eyes up to the fact that not only can you help create more jobs, but simply just taking action because it's all about the individual also taking responsibility as well rather than just complaining. <laughs> you bet, Daniel. You bet. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. You bet. Again, the book is The Great American Jobs Scam, and our guest joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program, Greg Leroy. So be sure to visit the website, greatamericanjobsscam.com, to find out more about how you can get involved, because it could be your friend, or it could be your father, it could be your mother, sister, aunt, uncle, whoever, who may be out of a job, and just by simply changing things a little bit, can help them on their road to prosperity. We want to thank you for tuning in. You've been listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I also want to thank our following sponsor for making this program possible, and that is ZRT Laboratory. If you're suffering from hot flashes, foggy thinking, sudden weight gain, low libido, mood swings, and other effects of aging, ZRT Laboratory, the forerunner in hormone testing, is your first step toward ending troublesome symptoms. Visit them online at www.zrtlab.com to find out how ZRT Labs Home Collection Kits can help detect and correct hidden hormone imbalances. Let ZRT testing be your guide to symptom relief and life-changing solutions that begin with you. Physician guidance is recommended. Thank you for tuning in. You've been listening to the Beyond 50 Radio program. Be sure to visit us at our website at beyond 50 Radio. Dot com, the number 50, and also sign up for our free weekly e-newsletter as well. Be sure also to stop by our blog where we also post all of our past shows and also great resources as well for you, the listener, to be able to use. Again, thanks for tuning in. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program. Remember, live your day past halfway.